Thank you, John. Thank you again, Minister O'Regan. Um, I think that was a great way to kick off our conference this year, uh, to see uh, such a, a passionate endorsement of nuclear from the federal government of Canada. Um, we're now going to move right into our next discussion on regulating and industry oversight for the future. As many of you know, speaking uh, with the president and CEO of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is a bit of a tradition here at the CNA conference. Last year, Romina Velshi, who many of you know from her work in the industry, uh, appeared for the first time in her new role, and she suggested we broaden the field, and we were joined by regulators from the UK and the United States. This year, Romina will be joined by the chairman of the World Nuclear Organization. So we're gonna start with a presentation from Romina Velshi, who was appointed president and chief executive officer of the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for a five-year term beginning in August of 2018. Ms. Velshi has had a long association with the CNSC. She was appointed as a permanent part-time commission member in 2011 and reappointed for a second five-year term in March 2018. She has extensive technical, regulatory, and adjudication ex expertise in the area of energy. Throughout her career, she has worked in various capacities at Ontario Hydro and Ontario Power Generation. Ms. Velshi was also one of the founding members of Canada's Women in Science and Engineering and served as vice chair on the board of directors of Scientists in School, a nonprofit organization that provides STEM-focused workshops to more than 700,000 students each year. Ms. Velshi is also very active in international development activities. She is the founding member of Focus Humanitarian Assistance Canada, an internationally recognized humanitarian agency. She served for four years at the Aga Khan Foundation Canada's City Chair for Toronto for the World Partnership Events, Canada's largest annual event dedicated to increasing awareness and raising funds to, to fight global poverty. Please welcome Romina Velshi. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a pleasure being here with you today. Behind me is a picture of uh, last year's CNA conference, the one that uh, Mark alluded to, where my uh, two counterparts from the UK and US, Adrian Kelby and uh, um, Christine Svenicki, joined me on uh, the stage for us to share our perspectives on new nuclear and the role of regulators. And we had so much fun. And I think the audience enjoyed our session as well. So we have been asked for a repeat performance or a similar performance at the 2020 WIN Global Conference that WIN Canada is hosting in Niagara Falls from October 4th to the 8th uh, this year. And I hope to see most of you there for that event. Today, I'm delighted to join uh, Tom Mitchell and uh, Mark Sutcliffe later for um, um, a fireside chat after our uh, presentations. And although we have different mandates, the World Association of Nuclear Operators and Nuclear Regulators share a crucial mission, working with skill and dedication to ensure worker and public safety. I will cover two areas in my remarks today. First, I will focus on what the CNSC is doing to promote the international harmonization of regulatory requirements for advanced and small modular reactors. Second, I will share a few thoughts on the importance of building and maintaining public confidence and trust in a time of new challenges and new opportunities. Navigating this bold new future will require the best of all of us, and time is of the essence, because the SMR journey has already begun, including right here in Canada. As we heard from the minister, the publication of the 2018 Pan-Canadian SMR Roadmap, the collaboration between New Brunswick, Ontario, and Saskatchewan to develop a strategy for the deployment of SMRs, 
and the CNSC's ongoing environmental assessment for a 15 thermal megawatt microreactor on the Chalk River Laboratory site all point to a potentially disruptive, perhaps even transformative future just around the corner. A changing world also demands new perspectives and responses. Safety is our first and last concern. It's our touchstone. However, I strongly believe we also need a regulatory strategy to encourage greater collaboration and harmonization, which is something I have been advocating strongly, especially over the last six months. We took a very important step last August when I signed a memorandum of cooperation with the chairman of the USNRC. This agreement will guide our work on advanced and small modular reactors. In fact, we're already making good progress together. We've agreed to share regulatory insights from technical design reviews, starting with new scale and terrestrial energy technologies. We are also looking at developing common guidance for reviewing new build license applications. But it's not just the US. We're likewise involved with the UK's nuclear regulator on SMRs and advanced reactors and welcome a similar arrangement with the UK's nuclear regulator within the next few uh, months. It makes sense for us to share our analysis, testing, modeling, and research. Others can learn from us, and we can learn from others. We can save time, we can avoid pointless duplication. And in so doing, we can help to encourage both innovation and modern regulation, all while remaining squarely focused on the imperative of safety. We all want to get this right. Working together will help us achieve this goal. It is my hope that cooperative undertakings like this will demonstrate to other nuclear regulators the benefits of close collaboration and perhaps set the stage for progress toward a harmonization of regulatory requirements like we see in the aviation industry. In fact, there is already a degree of harmonization in the nuclear regulatory community on nuclear substances transport regulations and licensing and certification of transportation packages. With that goal in mind, I was very pleased to hear from Director General Bill Magwood that the Nuclear Energy Agency has agreed to look at different models for greater regulatory cooperation on SMRs. And I know the World Nuclear Association and the Can Do Owners Group are finalizing a white paper on how the goal of a worldwide nuclear regulatory environment where internationally accepted standardized reactor designs can be widely deployed without major design changes at the national level can be achieved. I very much look forward to this white paper. I want to be absolutely clear. Regulatory sovereignty is essential. We must and we will always answer to Canadians and their leaders. But I believe it is in our interest and in the interest of Canadians to seek out greater harmonization of requirements amongst regulators around the world. If we are successful, we will establish a foundation for embarking nuclear countries, a roadmap for them to follow as they develop their own regulatory systems focused on safety. Much will be required and expected of us as we navigate this future. In order for regulators to make progress on harmonization, industry will need to seriously consider how many technology designs are sustainable and then work toward a common set of codes and standards. For regulators, it means demonstrating that we are not a barrier to innovation and advancement, that our role as a science-based organization is to protect the public from risk, 
not from progress. I think the time is now to think boldly and look critically at regulatory frameworks and be open to the need to re-engineer them. It may be time for a paradigm shift in the regulatory space. SMRs will be first-of-kind projects. The public will rightfully expect and demand that they be demonstrated to be safe. Any misstep on the part of industry or by us as the regulator will likely cause public support to quickly evaporate. Which brings me to my second topic, building and sustaining public confidence and trust in the regulator. More than any other industry, nuclear relies on building and maintaining relationship of trust with Canadians, including indigenous communities. People need to be confident that nuclear facilities are operating safely and are well protected in the event of the unexpected. So let's talk about the recent false alert at Pickering because it teaches us an essential lesson. It can take years to build trust and confidence and a split second to lose it. When it comes to nuclear power, there is no room for error, not on design, not on safety, and not on how we communicate with the public. The responses to that alert were far too slow on all sides, including ours at the CNSC. Public trust and confidence was clearly, undeniably, and rightfully diminished. Our shared task now is understand what went wrong, learn from it, make the changes required to ensure it never happens again. We at the CNSC are conducting a thorough review, so is the province of Ontario. I understand the province's investigation report is uh, being tabled today. We all need to make it a priority to learn from this incident and to tell the public how we're going to do better. Now, with the topics of trust and confidence in mind, I'd like to share with you some of the results of a recent public opinion sur sur survey we commissioned from Nanos Research. I must admit, I had a lot of trepidation in commissioning this survey, which was a first for the CNSC, and especially considering the data was being collected two weeks after the Pickering false alert. So the two key elements to this research, the first was interviews with key stakeholders, and the second, a general population survey which was administered to over 1,000 Canadians. We just got the report last week, but today I want to focus on the big picture takeaways from this survey. The first thing I would note is the consistency in responses across the country, even though major nuclear facilities are located in just a few provinces, and this came as a bit of a surprise. Secondly, across all categories of stakeholders interviewed, be it nuclear host community mayors, indigenous group leaders, members of civil society organizations, and industry leaders, they all expressed high confidence in the CNSC's professionalism and in our ability to execute our nuclear safety mandate, giving us scores greater than eight out of 10. This is very reassuring to me and should be to you as well. As you can see in the slide behind me, the level of awareness of the CNSC as Canada's nuclear regulator is middling at best and this does not come as a great surprise. For those Canadians who are aware of us, around a quarter are completely positive, and only about 5% are completely negative. There is an untapped 50% right in the middle who are neutral, and potentially open to learning more and reaching their own conclusions on whether we are an effective, independent, competent and trustworthy regulator. 
Up next, we see a mixed message between confidence in nuclear regulation writ large and the regulator's independence from industry. I find it encouraging that 83% of the public has confidence in the government to ensure safe regulation of what is for many still a lauded term, nuclear. This result gives me hope that if we communicate and engage with the public and communities in ways that resonate with them, we can build or reinforce confidence in the oversight of the nuclear sector. At the same time, a moderate 62% of respondents have confidence in us to maintain our, our, our independence from industry. This suggests that we have to do more to inform, remind, or demonstrate to Canadians of our independence and make clear that our interactions with industry are always in the interest of ensuring safety. Finally, we see that more than 80% of Canadians want to get involved in nuclear-related decisions in their communities. A full 40% say they want to be highly involved. By way of contrast, only 20% of respondents have complete confidence in our efforts to consult communities. So what do we take away from this data? First, the message is clear. We need to do more to establish and strengthen relationships. I have already had the opportunity during my 18 months as president to start building stronger relationships with indigenous communities, environmental, non-governmental organizations, industry, and other stakeholders. Strengthening these relationships will continue to be one of my top priorities. Second, we need to redouble our efforts to become the trusted go-to source for the public for all things nuclear. We already hold public community meetings and webinars. We ensure that our commission proceedings are open and transparent. And through our participant funding program, we provide financial support to increase participation in our regulatory and licensing processes. Clearly, this is not enough. We need to do more, and we are determined to do so. Lastly, we need to consider changes to when and how we consult with the public, with indigenous groups, and with others. We are contemplating important reforms to the Commission's processes and proceedings to make participation even more accessible and meaningful. So stay tuned for our future plans on this important topic. Overall, I'm encouraged by the results of the survey. They will help to guide our work and monitor our progress. We are an organization focused on continuous improvement. We have an unflinching commitment to safety. And we are committed to finding ways meaningful ways, not just window dressing, to increase the confidence and trust in the regulator in the years ahead. In closing, I have worked in the nuclear sector for more than three decades. I am proud of its past. But I am even more energized and excited about the future, the opportunities that await, and the potential that is yet to be achieved. We are at a crossroads in the evolution of our sector. There is much work to do to ensure we navigate it smartly and safely, especially in terms of innovation, collaboration, harmonization, and trust building. At the CNSC, we are taking the lead, and I hope you will join us. Thank you. Thank you, Romina. Thank you for sharing that very interesting data. I invite you to take a seat there where we'll soon be chatting. Uh, but just before we do that, uh, let's introduce the chairman of the World Association of Nuclear Operators, 
Tom Mitchell, who of course is no stranger to this group. Tom has more than 40 years of nuclear energy leadership experience. He currently serves on the board of directors of First Energy Corporation and is chair of the board's nuclear committee and a member of the governance committee as well. Tom, of course, is the retired president, CEO, and director of Ontario Power Generation. In that role and as chief nuclear officer, Tom was directly responsible for the safe, reliable, and cost-effective operation of 10 can-do design nuclear units with 6,600 megawatts of capacity. Tom also served as CNA's chair for a number of years. Please welcome Tom Mitchell. Well, yeah, you know, it's great to be back. And I was thinking that, uh, you know, you mentioned that uh, I've been involved in CNA for a while. And I think this, I don't know how many conferences I've come to, probably a dozen. And I think every time I come here, there's a major snowstorm. <laughs> so uh, it feels really like home again with that, uh, that weather outside. So I, I wanted to, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my remarks brief, but I wanted to cover three kind of aspects of uh, uh, some of the things that we're doing at the World Association of Nuclear Operators. One is I wanted to give you a little bit of information about the organization because you may not, all of you may not uh, fully know about it. I wanted to talk about nuclear now. And I also wanted to talk about what WANO is doing to support the industry in nuclear now. So here's a little bit about WANO. WANO is a extremely uh, unique organization. Uh, it was founded in 1989, and every single operator, company that operates nuclear power reactors in the world is a member of WANO. And so that is a, a very large challenge. Uh, to manage that challenge, we actually have uh, regional offices in Atlanta, Tokyo, Paris, Moscow, a coordinating office in London, and I'll show you a number shortly that will explain to you why we are working to open an office in Shanghai. Now, the unique thing about uh, WANO's membership is that it's completely voluntary, completely voluntary. And we have just celebrated last year our 30th year in operation. Uh, we are technology neutral. We, our members operate uh, essentially every single type of nuclear power plant in the world that exists. And so we have a lot of experience with different types of plants. Uh, we have 120 members and our remit is to oversee the operation of over 450 nuclear facilities around the world. You know, as I, as I was thinking, as President Belchi was talking about harmonization, you know, really I think what you ought to think about when you think about WANO is it's a representation of the community of the nuclear operators coming together in a harmonized way. We have achieved this in, in, in respect and that degree of harmonization across the world because we have developed and used and vetted now a common set of performance, in, of performance indicators and performance objectives and um, uh, peer reviews, operating experience sharing uh, across the world. So harmonization is possible. It can occur, and I think we're in a living embodiment of that. So our members commit uh, to meeting uh, and participating in our programs, and we have a mission, and I won't read that to you, but uh, essentially the focus of our organization is on us assessing, benchmarking, and emulating best practices in you know, nuclear operations at every single nuclear power facility around the world, including Canada. Now, 
nuclear now. You know, I've been trying to get my, my, I've tried my head around what does that really mean in an international context. As you reflect today on uh, the path forward for Canada. And there's a number I would like you to write down. Write down on a piece of paper. And there's one number I want you to remember. And that number is 56. No, that's not my age. I wish I was in my 50s again. The number is 56. And why, why that number? So did you know that since 2011, 56 reactors have started up around the world? 56. And I know that the next number says 52, number of units under construction. I actually was reading World Nuclear News yesterday morning and discovered that number is also 56. So now you only have to remember one number. But think about that for a second. 56 reactors have started up since 2011 in the world. And there's 56 under construction. And I can assure you that number is going to continue to change and go up. Because if you look at the last number there, which is a number you can, you can remember as an optional credit, 32 of that are being built in Asia. Hence, we're looking at opening an office in Asia because these are our members and we're here to support our members. So as you think about that, you know, a lot of times uh, I think in, in our industry as we listen to what we read in the media and wonder what is the trajectory of our industry we are a growing industry. And so one of the questions that uh, this means for Wano is what are we doing to support the industry in the path for new nuclear units? So what I've shown here is a, uh, a slide, and you can read it. It gives you some uh, indication of the number of things that uh, uh, we provide under the title of new unit assistance. And you can see there's a number of programs there. Also, I've, I've uh, shown a picture of a document, which I think is a reflection again of this harmonization approach. Uh, this is a uh, piece of work that reflects the common experience of three organizations, IAEA, EPRI, and Wano. And it has meant, we've heard the word already this morning, a roadmap. This is a roadmap of how to be successful in moving from the end of construction phase to operational phase reliably and safely. And given the numbers I've just shown you, you can see that the industry collectively, as operators, as Wano, as an industry, we have a tremendous experience base now in doing that successfully. And if you go on the WANO website, just Google WANO.org, uh, it will take you to this information and to this document. Now, this is an eye exam for those of you in the back room. No, I'm not expecting you to read this. This is just a chart from that document. And I just wanted you to know that uh, what this lays out, if you could read the fine print, is that there are 18 modules that have been developed, specific tailored modules in various different facets of that transition from construction to operation. It's all been laid out. This is a timeline, a sort of representative timeline of when those that might occur. Uh, Obviously, the sooner that a organization that has decided to construct and operate a nuclear power plant uh, decides to get involved in this, we can lay out this plan. And uh, you know, what, I, what I can tell you is, is that there is a community of nuclear operators that is willing, ready, and able 
to provide all of the experience that we've gained in this process in specific activities that can be tailored uh, to the situation for the plant. And as you can see on the one highlight on the side, just to give you a sense, WANO has conducted over 120 of these activities around the world. So, what does this mean for Canada? If you decide uh, to uh, build a new nuclear in Canada, including SMRs, one is going to be there with you. We'll be a partner with you to ensure that the transition from construction, the end of construction to operation, is done safely and reliably. And we will bring to bear all the resources that are necessary to make that happen. I mean, think about it. As a new operator of a plant, uh, whether that's in an established jurisdiction or a new jurisdiction, uh, it is in the, your best interest uh, to have a error-free and safe and reliable startup. And I can assure you, it is in the world's operator's interest that uh, that also be the case. So this is really a win-win for us. Also, I just wanted to take an opportunity to acknowledge uh, the WANO member companies in the room. Uh, we have the full support of our Canadian members. Uh, they fully participate uh, in, in, in our programs and our support our programs. And uh, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, their impact, not only in Canada, but in wor worldwide activities in support of WANO. And so at the bottom there is a link. Click on that link. That'll take you to the WANO website. And uh, you can read that uh, diagram with all those boxes a lot easier on the web than you can in this, on this slide. So again, uh, it's an exciting time. It's great to be back. And I wish you all the success in the future as you continue on your nuclear journey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom, and um, thank you for joining us over here. Uh, so uh, let's discuss this a little further, and uh, we will have time for your questions, by the way, in just a few minutes. So if you have a question, we'll have microphones available. Get ready to put up your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. Um, Romina, you spoke about public trust and confidence, and uh, uh, a few years ago, Mark Carney said, uh, the former Bank of Canada governor said, trust arrives on foot and leaves in a Ferrari. Um, how do you, uh, you know, how do we manage things through a period where events that occur that are beyond anyone's control can have an impact on your work, on the industry's work? Um, thank you. In fact, I like Mark Carney's better than the, the, the phrase I use, so I think I may steal it for my future uh, <laughs> talks. Uh, so let me use the Pickering Falls Alert as an example of uh, what that means for us and how we at the CNSC are, uh, are reacting to it and, and how we use that to continue strengthening public confidence and trust. That false alert was uh, an opportunity there's always a silver lining to some of these events, and this actually gave us an opportunity to assess our ability to disseminate information that Canadians want to get from the regulator quickly and accurately. And we weren't able to deliver on that uh, for a number of reasons. We have an investigation going on right now, so we will find out what comes out of that. But what it's also shown us is that when we do, uh, and we, we have a very robust emergency planning uh, processes, programs, drills, exercises, but we've never drilled for a false alert before. And uh, given what happened in Hawaii last year and what happened here this year, that's more likely to happen more often than a real emergency, so drilling for that may be a good thing to do. Um, but you know, it also showed the impact it had on the public. And if I look just at the number of potassium iodide pills that have been ordered as a result of that particular 
false alert gives you an indication of not only the level of anxiety that it may have caused in the public, but the public's awareness that they actually have to do something in the, if, if there is a nuclear emergency. So I understand there are like 65,000 uh, potassium iodide pills that have been ordered. And of that, about 8,000 have been ordered within a community that have pre-distributed KI pills. So they weren't able to find them, I guess, when, if they thought they needed that. So it was a good way for us to even test uh, the readiness if there was a real emergency. So all this goes to show that this actually has provided us an opportunity to make sure that we uh, have the uh, technology and the capacity to respond to those needs that we are actually going to learn from that. So we at the CNSC are doing an investigation. The province, I said, is uh, tabling a report on their investigation. I understand the utilities and municipalities may have also been uh, doing uh, lessons learned from this. And in April, we're going to have a commission meeting that will be open to the public where we want to talk about why it happened, how it happened, and what we can learn from it, and hopefully give reassurance to the public uh, and be very transparent that, you know, we, did, we want at our best here, and uh, here's what we're doing uh, going forward to make sure that that doesn't happen. So I think learning, uh, sharing uh, practices, we've also shared this with uh, other regulators, uh, make sure that you test your website's capacity for surge in demand in the event of an emergency, um, that we uh, learn from this and are transparent about our lessons learned, I think would go a long ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom, because you're in this uh, unique position now of having had this great experience in Canada and understanding uh, our scene, uh, but also now, uh, you know, having this global perspective on everything. Um, can you share with us a little on uh, what you see as the trajectory of nuclear internationally and also some lessons for Canada? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, I, I guess what, you know, kind of outline maybe uh, four trends, and I think as I go through those, you'll sort of see the parallels with Canada. Uh, there are you know, nuclear units in the world that are uh, reaching their end of life. And so uh, a lot of focus of uh, operating those plants safely and reliably until the end of life. Um, and uh, you know, that I think would sort of uh, be uh, you know, similar to the situation at Pickering. Uh, also in the world, there is a large amount of investment being made in extending the life of stations. And I think the parallel again in Canada is very clear. You have refurbishments at Bruce Power and at, uh, and at, Dar at uh, Bruce and, and Darlington. Uh, but that is a worldwide trend. And so, uh, uh, you know, just as an example, uh, uh, I, I believe there are now uh, two or maybe four units in the United States that have received licenses to operate for 80 years. So the initial licenses were 40 years, and then uh, many plants moved to 60 years, and now we have stations in the US that are moving to 80 years. So you know, making that investment. Uh, but it's, just, it's not in the United States. It's, it's throughout the world uh, that uh, large organizations are making uh, significant investments to extend the life of uh, existing plants. Uh, obviously, new build, and I've talked about you know what's going on in the world and that, and uh, you know obviously the focus of this conference is to be thinking about what is that in the Canadian context. I guess the fourth thing I would just highlight is there is a lot of look at new and different technologies, uh, different fuel cycles, for example, thorium fuel cycles in, in countries that have uh, you know thorium uh, fuel assets, um, uh, floating nuclear power plants. You know, which is really uh, you know, a uh, SMR type of design. Uh, uh, SMRs in general, uh, I think, uh, is uh, something that you uh, will see uh, uh, a lot of activity and looking at deploying uh, you know, throughout the world. So, um, you know, this is a, uh, I guess another one on the new development would be fast reactors. There are, there are fast reactors. And again, maybe just to come back to the WANO context, is uh, WANO is involved in uh, those activities. And I, I heard something this morning about uh, uh, nuclear ships. 
Um, we have uh, we have icebreakers that are WANO members. We have nuclear-powered cargo ships that are WANO members, and the floating nuclear power plant is a WANO member. Wow. Um, what advice, from an international perspective, do you have to Canada as we go down the path of SMRs? Oh, well, uh, I, I think uh, you know the, this is the type of conference I think where it, it's good now to think about what are what is the plan, what are the next steps, and uh, you know I think you know given the uh, trajectory that I've uh, described, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I think the time to engage and to map out uh, uh, Canada, wh where Canada is going to position itself in the development and emergence of this technology, this, this is the moment. Uh, seize the day. Uh, I, I guess, uh, and you know, from Wano's perspective, we're, we're technology neutral, so uh, you know, whatever, whatever is developed, I'm, I'm sure we can uh, adapt. And, uh, and I would also tell you that if we need to look at our processes or uh, standards and criteria and you know, modify those for uh, a different type of technology in the future, we'll, we, will, uh, we will certainly do that in support of our members. Um, I guess just maybe a key piece of advice that's outside of the scope of what I normally get involved in, but just to share with this room is, uh, my advice would be to focus a lot on project management because I think I think the public acceptance and confidence in, the, uh, you know, in, the, in this technology will very much depend on the ability to deliver the first units on time and on budget. Okay. Uh, Romina, you, uh, you spoke about uh, harmonization of regulatory requirements, and you've done a lot of important work in that area. I think you've alluded as well to the fact that there is likely to be some pushback uh, over the issue of regulatory sovereignty. Um, so what do you think could be done to, to overcome some of that resistance? So let me, let me start off by saying why I believe harmonization is important from a regulator's perspective. I mean, from industry's perspective, harmonization helps uh, easier deployment of, re, uh, of a standard design and you get economies of scale. From a regulator's perspective, um, it's what the minister said, you know, what's expected of the regulator, stringent and streamlined. And where you have harmonization, where you have collaboration amongst regulators, you're making sure you're bringing the best perspectives, the different perspectives together. Uh, you're leveraging each other's knowledge, expertise, resources, research. And when it comes to new technology, it's not just the initial construction and getting into service, it's the long-term running. So you're actually getting into 60, 80 years of a relationship. And so when you talk about harmonization, if you have these common designs that are deployed worldwide, think of how easy it is for the regulatory community that's now overseeing this for the long term, how we can share best practices and uh, leverage our resources. So that's why harmonization is critical, because it also, um, given the urgency of the situation, truncates the timeline too. Uh, challenges and what can be done about that. Um, besides sovereignty, it's also, there is a concern that there may be a drive to the lowest common denominator, or that we may go for the most highest demanding standards. So I think it covers the full spectrum. And that's why uh, we in Canada are starting off with the US and the UK, because we're kind of like-minded regulators, and, and seeing how this is gonna work, and then hopefully expand. There are many knocking on the door wanting to join us. Uh, but as Tom said, this is not necessarily new for the industry to work together to agree on a common set of objectives and standards. That's where the IAEA, the NEA, I mean, there's just so many fora where the regulators come together and agree on things. So I think it just requires, as we're seeing in this theme, to be bold, to persevere, uh, to be passionate about it, and uh, make it happen. Okay. We have time for one or two questions from the audience. So uh, if you have a question, please put up your hand. 
very soon, and we will uh, get a microphone to you. We have a question here in the front. If anybody else has a question, we'll get a microphone to you as well so that we're, uh, we're ready to go. There's one uh, back here, so we'll start there cause, just because the microphone's closer. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, I've got a question. It relates to trust, and it relates to uh, the potential lessons learned from the Boeing 737 MAX. And it has two aspects to it, so it's a question for both Rumina and for Tom. For Rumina, uh, there have to be lessons learned from uh, a regulatory perspective in how uh, international regulators uh, accepted, uh, but maybe not thoroughly validated the uh, decisions made by the uh, host country uh, regulator uh, to certify the uh, Boeing 737 MAX. Uh, have you started to do your own uh, lessons learned and to determine what regulatory lessons learned uh, to make of it? And just before you answer, the question for Tom is, uh, I've been involved for many decades uh, in uh, looking at significant uh, operating experience reports from WANO, looking at the IMPO uh, similar reports, and every time a significant event happens, regardless of whether it's in the nuclear industry, uh, WANO and IMPO always undertake to do an operating experience report communicate lessons learned to the operators. And can you share some of the thoughts that have come out of any uh, operating experience uh, reports that, uh, that uh, have been undertaken with respect to the 737 MAX? Because we're talking about a relatively modest innovation in technology that was supposed to have been uh, the cornerstone of the, uh, the 737 MAX. But what we're seeing is many unintended gaps that seem to have occurred in both the design, in the scrutiny of the regulator, and in how the airlines that uh, acquired those planes prepared themselves to uh, fly those planes. Okay. Um, Romina, you want to go first? Thank you. Uh, and thank you for the question. Um, we realized very much at the outset that uh, this uh, disaster, this tragedy, uh, really uh, there were lots of opportunities for us to learn from that and uh, set up a, a task team to look at what were the lessons uh, from Boeing. And uh, we're expecting our report to be issued in the spring of this year, and it will be made public. And, and clearly, one of the key lessons um, th and that um, and, and, and the story keeps on unfolding, and, and just this week, we've heard uh, from um, the hearings that are underway right now uh, from the Canadian regulator uh, on, on aviation on uh, how things went awry and what we could uh, have done differently. Uh, but clearly, um, it was whether uh, the, the domestic regulator um, maybe abdicated their responsibility to the licensee or um, um, did not fulfill their um, necessary uh, obligation as the regulator and the Canadian regulator depending too much on the other regulator not doing its own due diligence and uh, verification. So yes, we are looking to see what are the lessons learned. Uh, we are expecting uh, a report and then our own action plans on what we would do differently. Um, as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, we're very much looking at the aviation industry on how harmonization there has worked, uh, but it's not without its own pitfalls and learnings uh, that we need to make sure that we're aware of and uh, including in, in our journey. So stay tuned for our report. Okay, Tom? Yeah, I think uh, you know, Ramina uh, you know, has talked about the fact that uh, uh, obviously as an, as an industry, uh, we pride ourselves in learning, you know, uh, both from you know, within our industry and from outside. And I, I guess our sense right now is on, on this particular event, uh, which we are sure there are a lot of learnings, 
it's, it still seems like it's in the phase of where they're, you know, still sort of developing the, uh, you know, actual, you know, facts around this and, you know, what were the breakdowns. And so, uh, you know, when that occurs, uh, you know, we will take a, a good look at that. Uh, and I guess just as a, you know, kind of a reaction when I think about, you know, the, uh, uh, you, know, the our, you know, our criteria and the things that we have in place, uh, I, I think, you know, th these are issues that are certainly addressed uh, in, in our standards. Uh, I, th I think the most imp important lessons will be, as, as you mentioned, is w what, what broke down in those processes so that we can give some specific feedback on, uh, you know, what, what are the areas to target. Okay, question right here. Um, I, my question relates to uh, cybersecurity and um, with the proliferation of uh, new build around the world and um, the um, news reports of universities being held capture and hospital security being sort of um, penetrated. Um, a question for both panelists in terms of um, regulatory development in this area and um, some of the more practical things that are being contemplated to um, sort of keep up with the sophistication of uh, cyber terrorism um, globally. Uh, comments, thank you. Tom? Well, uh, for, for one, the answer is, is that the one, the one area that we do not look at <laughs> is security uh, because it is, tends to be a very country specific and regulatory specific. Uh, and obviously, as, uh, as an industry, uh, you know, I think we share all the same uh, concerns uh, and expect that those are going to, uh, those lessons and requirements are going to be built into uh, the requirements to, to uh, safely operate the plants. Uh, but currently, it's not an area that we are focusing on uh, because it's sort of the one area that we, uh, 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 is outside of our remit. Uh, so we uh, clearly as regulators recognize this is uh, a high risk area for us. And uh, just in the last few months, Canada hosted an international conference on uh, what, particularly when it comes to new technologies, how are we making sure we're uh, at least in pace, if not uh, ahead of uh, where this is leading to. And uh, coming up with uh, not only requirements, but processes that will make sure that we stay abreast uh, with that. We're also, and, and not just on cybersecurity, but security just more broadly, uh, making sure that security and safety are better integrated. Uh, again, as we look at uh, requirements, uh, regulatory requirements for new technologies that we, we're very much aware that we need to stay abreast on this. Okay. We're going to have to stop there just because uh, we want to keep things moving this morning. But I want to say a huge thank you to Tom and Romina. Thank you so much for being great panelists. Thank you for your presentations. Well done. Yeah. Now, um, as has become a tradition here at the CNA, uh, instead of uh, actually giving the speakers gifts, what we are doing is making a donation in the name of all of our program speakers today to a charity. This year we are making a contribution to the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. Now, thank you. For those that need to check their email, let me advise you uh, that we have set up two internet cafes sponsored by Tetra Tech. One is located by their booth right outside the doors to this room. The other is along the windows in the middle of the Governor General's ballroom. For those of you who have Wi-Fi enabled devices, I'll remind you that there is complimentary Wi-Fi uh, and the uh, password is CNA2020. Remember, CNA is in lower case. If you need to charge your mobile device, Cameco is sponsoring a secure charging station. It's located on the window wall of the Governor General's ballroom. Again this year, we have our very own mobile app sponsored by Westinghouse. It has the conference schedule. It has the speakers.